there is a God that requires you right where you are right now. When Daniel prayed, it was a lifestyle, not an occasional exercise. When the people persecuted him, when the people reported him, when the people tried to get him in trouble, he didn't stay out of it. He continued. But here is what is so important. When Daniel was thrown in the lion's den, Daniel had to deal with fear. He had to overcome fear. Fear was his stone that had to be rolled away. He did not allow fear to paralyze him. I assure you, every one of those lions were alive and well and hungry, but they didn't eat Daniel. Daniel was saved by the God that he believed. Because even in the midst of what would have brought fear, he did not allow his stone to be in the way. When you hear about these biblical characters, please, do not think of them as people created in heaven with wings and as semi-human or supernaturally powerful. They were human beings just like me and you. They were dealing with the same God that is spoken of in Malachi, spoken of in Hebrews 13:8, as never changing. Who is it that shut the mouths of lion? It is God. Who is it that quenches the fires of the enemy? It is God. Because the same God was with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. When they too were threatened, the king commanded that the furnace should be heated up even more than it normally would be heated up. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they knew that this is real. Your faith is real. Your belief in God is real. They were between being consumed by the fire and denouncing their faith and their belief. They refused to back away. The Bible says they threw them into the fiery furnace. The fire never went up. The fire was still burning. The furnace was still hot because they did not allow their stone to paralyze them. When they threw them into that furnace, the king looked and said, we put three people in the fire. But I see four. And the fourth one looks like the Son of Man. That is true. It was Jesus, the Son of Man. It was the one that said, I will be with you in trouble. It was the one that said, Though you go through the valley of the shadow of death, I will be with you. It was the same one that said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Many times you look at the fire and it's just too hot and it's just too threatening and you want to begin to sidetrack and take steps backward. You move one day by faith, the next day you take several steps back because there is something that is threatening, something that poses a danger to you. Now God is saying to you today that in the case of Daniel, the stone of fear couldn't cripple him. It had to be put aside. In the case of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the fire could not burn them because God was with them. When God purifies you, when you go through those difficulties in your life, God is pruning you. God is shaping you. God is molding you because he wants you to be stronger than whatsoever the enemy can pose. If you do not go through stuff, you will not be able to handle stuff. You have to be going through things in order to be molded, to be strong when the enemy shows up. When the fire of God had already consumed iniquity from your life and the enemy lights and matches in front of you, you can never be afraid. Why? Because you have already gone through more fire than that. And that cannot dissuade or persuade you or turn your footsteps around in the wrong direction. Jesus in John chapter 5 goes to the pool of Bethesda. There is a man that was there for so many years and he had an ailment and in a season people will come because there was a miracle that happened in that season the, the angels will come and trouble the waters and when the angel troubled the waters whoever was the first to jump in the bible says he was cured of all of his sickness i can imagine this paralyzed man waiting by the pool. He couldn't help himself. But the situation was worse. Nobody could help him. People begin to pick who they are there for. When it comes a time that they could help someone that is faceless, someone that they do not know. Here this man was there for so long. 
Nobody helped him. Before he could crawl to get there, someone has beaten him. And that means next year, and then the next year, and then the next year. I don't know in your life if you have ever experienced a chronic problem. Something that is like year in and year out, year in and year out. And it's not like you would not like help. It's just that there is something about the word called formula. What formula does is it traps you in a mindset that you believe that this is the only way that this can be done. And so it can become very discouraging when the formula exonerated you and others are using the same formula to move ahead. And so Jesus came to break the formula. He came because the formula had to be set aside. When he saw that man, he said to him, Will thou be made whole? And he says to Jesus, I have no man to put me in the pool when the angels troubled him, troubled the pool. Jesus didn't ask him if he had a man or a human being or a help. He said, would you like to be made whole? The man is thinking of the formula. Jesus is thinking of his healing. He begins to perceive it by his communication that Jesus would have said, okay, I'll wait here till next year and help you when the water is dead. I submit to you that what God wants to do in your life, he does not need a formula to get it done. God can bypass a formula. He can bypass the natural laws. He can bypass the natural limitations. And God can reach into the place that he wants to get things done. And I'm speaking to you, some of you, the background of your life has already put your back on the ground. You come from a certain family that is seen not as wealthy and strong. You come from a place that is struggling and there is not too much resources. This is how you grew up and it has penetrated the fabric of your reasoning. And so God comes in and wants to unshackle you from that mindset, unshackle you and take you from the place that you found yourself to the place that you have never experienced. And it can be a little bit daunting. It can be a little bit frightening because then it is not something that you have conceived of. It's not something that you have perceived. If your father and your mother had 50 rand, you will just be satisfied with 55 not the five million that God is talking about. You begin to have a little trepidation like it's too good to be true. Well, God is here to make the it's too good to be true become the truth in your life in the name of Jesus Christ. No matter where you were, you cannot allow your background to keep your back on the ground because God is able to raise you. If you look around yourself, see every circumstance around you and it's depressing and it's weighing you down and it's putting you almost in a state that you are unable to rise. I am telling you, when you roll away the stone, God will arise and the enemy shall be scattered. When you take away the stone of unbelief, the stone that makes you stuck in a mindset, God will arise on your behalf because whenever you look around and there is nothing to scream or shout or rejoice about, do not forget that there is one place that you need to look that you didn't look before. If you look around you and it looks down, all you have to do is look up because your redemption is nigh. All you have to do is look up. As David said, I will set my eyes upon the hills from whence cometh my help. Your help may not come from your circumstance or situation or people around you, but when you look up, you're looking up to God and God will raise you up in the name of Jesus. The man was healed instantly with no formula. Take you away the stone. I'll cover one more stone and we'll call it a day. Moses, if you remember his history, Moses was a Hebrew little boy as a baby. Moses' life was preserved by God in that Pharaoh's household became the groomers and the mentors of Moses. But now God is going to use him to deliver the children of Israel from the hands of Pharaoh. Now, this is something to understand here. It comes that time that you almost are placed in a position where it looks like you're going to bite the hand that fed you for the glory of God. I'm not suggesting that we should make an attitude of it. But now, 
that he was raised in the camp of the enemy. He learned the ways of the enemy. And he had in his heart the plight of his people, the plight of the people of God. He saw their suffering, he saw their pain. Moses himself was not suffering. Moses was raised in royalty. He was part of the family of Pharaoh that his people were. I don't understand how it is that only what happens to you concerns you. It should be that when you have the heart of God, what happens to other people should concern you. It should cause there to be a little bit of irritation. It should cause there to be a little bit of empathy, of concern in you. The fact that you are dining at a five-course meal and you see a person that you can tell has not eaten for days and maybe weeks on end and you look at them as unfortunate people who will soon die to reduce world population and you begin to think of yourself as the lucky one who has been blessed with all of these things and when people ask you to lend a helping hand you say to them well the bible says the poor you will have with you always you contain yourself with scriptures that are carefully cherry-picked in order to satisfy your mindset and your proclivities and so what you would notice is that when a situation like that arises it takes one with a heart that is the heart of God when you are doing well the word compassion may not be a regular word to you because a person can struggle in life and the time that you're struggling in pain is a time that sometimes people reach out for God God if you will just help me in this situation I will worship I will honor you God if you will just give me a financial breakthrough I will save you for and so God in his infinite mercy brings the breakthrough but look at that man the next thing you see him doing he no longer avails himself to the word of God God if you bless me with a car I can use it to carry people to church but when God bless him with a car he is nowhere to be found he is driving off with his friends standing at the beach front just soaking in God's sunshine he has no time and even you yourself who used to know that person you will call them and they will cut you off because they do not belong in your chicken category anymore they are part of the eagles that fly now and so you cannot even reach them your phone number has been chunked it has been deleted because now they are other numbers that are for the elite and the wealthy they say you know they say the friends can even say there is this young man he's calling you do you know him he said oh no 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 i I don't know him at all and that's because he is not in your class now i remember at school there was a grandmother that used to come and visit one of his grandchildren at school and he would bring if you know uh, those native food to give to the to, to the grandchild now in the day and age that you eat hamburgers and sandwiches and things that makes you look developed and civilized. You don't want a grandmother showing up to visit you and brings those things whose names are only known to the ancestors and brings it as food, something that you don't even know what it is called. And now you are afraid to open this thing in front of your nice friends because what will they think of you to open this thing they're going to look at you funny and they will ask are you really going to eat that do you know the storm that this thing can cause in your stomach why not just go to win this because this thing we don't know what's in there and it scares me and many people will hide it do you know that when that grandmother came to the gate to look for that student they came and called that student and they described the grandmother do you know he said he doesn't know he doesn't even know her because he's going to bring something that is going to create a little embarrassment from his position of being a polished young child who only thinks of Wimpy's and McDonald's and Burger King and all of those things. Now somebody is bringing something so indigenous that it might have been brewed in the dark. It might have been something grabbed from the farm and just stayed up in a 
pot on top of a stove, not the, 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 the paraffin, not the gas, but the other one that is the iron with three stands and you stick wood around. And he doesn't want anybody to know that this has anything to do with his life. He has to show his friends that he is a Polish person. He denied that he even knew the grandmother. And I'm telling you, it takes a lot for people to be able to humble themselves. It takes a lot for people that are driving the finest cars to pull up and the grandmother says, you know what, I'm not like you. I don't have McDonald's. I don't have Burger King. I don't have Wimpy's. And the person doesn't look at it and say, oh, for grandma, forget about it. I, I, I ate before I came. The person rolls up his sleeves and says, I understand. I can fit anywhere I go because I am a child of God. I'll put my jacket on the side. I put my nice things on the side. I'm going to roll up my sleeves and I don't need a spoon or a knife or a fork. My bare hands are good enough. And the people stand around and look at him like, is he really? Look at the kind of car he drives. We didn't think he would touch such food. But you see, he had a car that didn't change who he is. He had a car that didn't make him become a different person. He had a car that didn't make him look down on other people. He was ready to be himself and he humbles himself and sits down and levels with the poor. The Bible says Moses had such a concern. He had concern for the people. He had concern. They suffering and I'm enjoying. Something is wrong. They are in distress. I am dining with the king. Something is wrong. But Moses got it wrong the first time. And this is where Moses himself had to put away the stone. God was Moses' stone. Do you remember in the scripture? And you can read this at your spare time in Exodus chapter 2. Moses saw an Egyptian fighting against a Hebrew. He stepped in and killed the Egyptian and buried him in the sand. Moses had acquired the knowledge that the Egyptians were the enemies of the Hebrews. So now I see an enemy, I need to kill him because if I don't kill him, he'll kill me first. And I cannot allow him to kill one like me. I must back this one and kill the other one. Moses thought that nobody saw it. It was a big secret. Until another day, he tries to separate a fight. And the person says to him, Oh, who made you to judge us? Are you going to kill me too like you killed that Egyptian? Sure. So everybody knows. Moses was gone. But the point of it is this. Moses might have had an impression that God is not happy with the Egyptians. But it was not up to Moses to become a small God and kill one. Because if the Egyptians were the problem and Moses killed one of them, there is still a problem until he kills all of them. And so now just killing one doesn't get rid of it. It's just a matter of allowing God who is able to circle your enemy in one lump and deal with them, period. Now you remember, as I'm closing now, Moses also had to roll away the stone of becoming a small God. Oh God, I need your power so I can do this. You know, there's a big I there. A big tall I is going to do it. God just needs to make me taller. I was a six foot I yesterday. If I can just be a nine foot I, I can take care of this situation. So I just need the power of God to stretch my height. But God is saying, it is not my power that you need. You need me and you need me to deal with the situation, not to direct you for you to be the one to deal with the situation. And so Moses could not have succeeded because there were many Egyptians. And after he finished killing all the Egyptians, he would have to kill Pharaoh and Pharaoh's army at the same time. Where was Moses going to go with this? How far was he going to go when he starts to kill one Egyptian? There are so many more left. And so that is a dead end street. Whenever you take matters into your hands in life, it is a dead end street because you don't know what lies ahead. And you underestimate the magnitude of the problem that you do have. You are like a person in that case that saw something and then you want to put your hand in a hole that you saw on a dead tree laying down in order to see what's in there. 
until you pull your hand out, if you can, to realize what bit you while you stick your hand in there in order to find out what you can get. Here we see Moses trying to play God. And playing God can really be a big obstacle. Now I want to tell you something. There is a difference between having faith in God and beginning to play God. You can find yourself playing God instead of having your faith in God. When you are playing God, you are the one doing it. When you're having your faith in God, He is the one doing the thing. And so you don't take matters into your hands simply because, well, you know, God might take too long. Moses had to put away that stone. And God used Moses to bring the children of Israel out of bondage to Canaan. As we get ready to pray, I urge you to examine what your stone is. Your stone can be unforgiveness. It can be hatred. Your stone can be self-righteousness. You're better than everyone else because you have the King James Version. You're better than everyone else because you sing in the choir. You're better than everyone else because you pray the longest prayer. You have the loudest voice at church. You are the one when the minister is preaching. You scream from wherever you are to get noticed. Preach on, pastor. Tell it as it is. So you say it. But they've been telling you as it is. And it is not as it is in your practical life. Because you did get notice. But you didn't post notice on the enemy. You stay out of my way. Or you are going to be crushed by my God, not by me. Anyone that likes to help God must have a weak God who cannot do by himself and is appealing for your assistance. No, we don't serve that type of a God. And as we pray today, I remember the children of Israel crossing the Red Sea. I remember God saying to them, that the Egyptians that you see today, you will see them no more. And I want to tell you that God was not referring to all Egyptians. He was referring to the ones they saw that day. They were going to see more Egyptians after that. But those particular ones that they saw that day, they were not going to see those ones anymore. There are some troubles sometimes that arise in our lives. And we would wish that we would see them no more. I want to tell you that God can do it for you. If you will put away the stone, God will arise on your behalf. Whatsoever that stone is. But when God spoke about seeing the Egyptians no more, those very ones he was referring not just to the physical Egyptians but the spirit that inhabit them the spirit that pursues them in your life you have to be able to look back at your life and count which enemies God had defeated on your behalf and know that when future enemies arise God will also do likewise so that you do not live a life of fear and intimidation. But I want to assure you that not all your enemies are outside. Some of your enemies are inside of you. The enemy on the inside is more dangerous because it is the enemy that has the stone that needs to be rolled away. And when the stone is rolled away, God will arise. And I say to you this day as was spoken by David, let God arise and let his enemies be scattered. Let God arise and let your blessings come flowing. Let God arise and let your favor find its path. Let God arise and let your reproaches be rolled away. Let God arise and let your breakthrough come forth like the morning. Let God arise and let situations change in your life. Let God arise and let your wisdom come from where the enemy was tying it up. Let God arise and let the knowledge of God deepen in you. Let God arise and let your weakness be turned to strength. Let God arise and let your sadness be turned to joy. Let God arise and let your mourning be turned to rejoicing. Let God arise and let your lostness be turned into the place of confidence. Let God arise and let a new day dawn in your life. 
that you too can say indeed that the Lord God Almighty, He is God. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray.